Following in Commander Shepard's star-studded footsteps came Captain Virgil Grissom. Everything is A-OK -okay until the heartbreaking finale. As the captain prepared to leave the capsule, explosive bolts on the escape hatch let go, and the Mercury is lost. However, the moon gets closer. The leading astronaut of the day, Gus Grissom, was slated to be the first man to walk on the moon. He was an outspoken man with the highest level of integrity. There was no way he would lie for anyone. He was also an outspoken critic of the dilapidated state of the moon program. Just before he died, he hung a lemon on the capsule and held a press conference in which he pointed out the sad state of the program. On the morning he died, upon having difficulty communicating from the capsule, he angrily asked, Hey, how are you going to get the moon? We can't talk between three buildings. In 1967, during a plugs-out test in which no engines were even ignited, they had him in a sealed capsule and pressurized it with 100% pure oxygen. A fire erupted, and all three astronauts perished. After this grisly incident, no other astronaut dared to criticize the program. And after all these years of lying and making their livings off the fame, none chooses to wreck this acclaimed success for the others by telling the truth. There is strong reason to doubt the fire was accidental. Page 81 of the Apollo 1 Accident Investigation Report, issued by the U.S. Congress, reveals that prior to the fire, NASA, by their own admission, were very well aware of the respective fires at the Johnsville Navy Air Station and Brooks Air Force Base. The fires in question, as pointed out by author Ralph Rene, were a result of sparks and even static electricity igniting the pure oxygen environments. In spite of these past fatalities, NASA used a 100% oxygen atmosphere in the Apollo 1 spacecraft, arguing that they had done it previously on the Gemini program. Of course they had. However, Gemini had a cabin pressure of only 3 pounds per square inch, the pure oxygen equivalent to the 14.7 pounds of nitrogen and oxygen at sea level. All previous aviation flash fires had been only slightly higher than Gemini's cabin pressure. Apollo 1's cabin pressure was more than five times higher. NASA was aware of the dangers, but they went ahead and sealed three of their astronauts inside a highly volatile capsule that had already been packed full of combustible and highly toxic materials, most of which were untested and had not been given their seal of approval before they were installed. The technicians on Pad 34 needed at least five minutes to open the command capsule's door. The astronauts had a mere 15 seconds before the fire consumed their cabin. Fire! We have fire, Captain! Additionally, in 1999, when Grissom's son, Scott, was granted access to his father's spacecraft, he uncovered evidence that a metal plate had been shoved behind the dashboard to deliberately trigger a spark. Keep in mind that many of these scientists were war criminals imported from Hitler's Germany. One should not be surprised that such horrors could occur when one considers that these Nazis helped perpetuate the cruelest, most brutal atrocity that has ever taken place in the history of mankind. Also, the behavior of the astronauts upon their return to Earth is highly suspicious. Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin were made to sit and brief the press for nearly an hour and a half. At times, all three men exhibited a type of disinterest or absconding emotion, not to mention outright lying. The most obvious error was in an answer given by Collins. The astronauts were asked if they could see stars from the surface of the moon. Armstrong answered, I don't recall. Then Collins, in an attempt to cover for Neil's mistake, and remembering his equal communal experience of sharing the capsule in Earth orbit for eight days with his crewmates, blurted out, I don't remember seeing any. I have two brief questions I'd like to ask, if I may. When you were carrying out that incredible moonwalk, did you find that the surface was equally firm anywhere, or were there harder and softer spots that you could detect? And secondly, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? The uh, first part of your question, the, the surface did vary in its 
thickness of penetrate, so one must be quite cautious in, in moving around in this rough terrain. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Neil, you were Transcripts Neil, you published were later attributed his remark to Aldrin, who was supposed to have been there on the surface. This was done, no doubt, to throw off most, who had only had an altered transcript and not a film copy of the entire press conference. I know there's a, a lot of scientists from uh, a number of countries standing by to see the lunar samples, and uh, we thought you'd be interested in seeing that they really are here. What about the moon rocks, the laser reflector disks, and the photographs of the astronauts on the moon? The Apollo samples are not rocks gathered during moonwalks. They are, in fact, meteorites that were specifically gathered on Earth by Von Braun himself before the moon landing ever took place. After Kennedy declared we would land on the moon by the end of the decade, the race to the moon was in full force. So why would Von Braun, who was supposed to be working feverishly on the Saturn V rocket, need to go to Antarctica? In the May 1967 Popular Science article entitled A Spaceman's Look at Antarctica, page 114 to 116, Von Braun states, It may well be smart to test lunar vehicles or surface drills in Antarctica before taking them to the moon. This was never done. He did, however, meet up with the penguins. In reality, the real reason for the trip was to gather meteorites that could be passed off as moon rocks. Some meteorites that actually originated from the moon can be found on Earth, as they can be expelled from the moon during meteor crashes. After Von Braun found them, the outer surfaces were probably blasted with an abrasive in a ceramics lab to hide the fact that they had fallen through the Earth's atmosphere. After the conclusion of the Apollo missions, some Apollo astronauts made money by taking tourists down to Antarctica to gather meteorites. Due to the contrast with the landscape, meteorites are easier to spot there. But it's evidence the astronauts left behind, and not what they brought back, that may offer the clinching proof. Each successful moon mission set up a range of experiments. More than 30 years after Apollo 11, one of them continues to operate, the Lunar Laser Ranger. There were two major experiments. One was a, a, a series of corner reflectors to reflect laser beams from the Earth sent to the moon that then, because of the geometry of these corner reflectors, would send the beam back in exactly the direction that it came from.